Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, today I'm going to be reviewing uh, Ship Beyond Time by Heidi Helig. Um, I read the first one last year. Uh, here. Um, the Girl from Everywhere. And I'm really annoyed the covers are so different. Uh, I was sent this one on NetGalley as well, but uh, the acceptance email <laughs> came the same day that they archived it. So by the time I got home from work, it wasn't available anymore so I could download it and I was very gutted and had spent several more weeks waiting to have the money to buy this. So I was very happy and excited to get it. This book starts um, right where the girl from everywhere left off. I wasn't so sure about the timeline when I was reading the girl from everywhere. That was one of the only things that kind of let it down for me was that I couldn't really get it all in my head and I'm usually very good at twi figuring out twists and weaves and complicated timeness in books. Um, but this one was kind of left me a bit, uh, where are we? Um, so this one, actually the timeline was quite easy to understand. It has lots of neat little loops and um, uh, what are they called? Paradoxes, those things. And there's lots more exploration about what happens when you travel through time in this way and at the start of this book Nyx and Kesh um, they go to a mystical um, island off the coast of France. Um, it was one I'd heard of before so it was really cool. It was supposed to be a utopia but I didn't really feel like the world building was very good in this book because nothing really seemed appealing about this place at all. Um, the like subtle references to it not being a great place kind of overwhelmed the it's supposed to be a great placeness. Um, but it was interesting to see more of um, how the kind of mythology kind of area works alongside the uh, reality of time travel and not just their time travel but like their place travel. So these islands surely they've, they've got a whole trade network it's not just the island it's the whole world itself. Um, but I kind of got the sense in this book that that's actually not true despite them having trade networks. There's um, one character, side character, who tries to sail away from this island having arrived there and she's just said to sort of be in the margins and not really going anywhere and just being lost. So I'm not sure how trade really works in these kind of mystical places, but it was an interesting question to kind of ponder about, I suppose. Nyx's development in this book wasn't particularly great, I don't think. In the first book there's a love triangle and by the end of the first book she has kind of decided that she actually wants one of those people. And this book it didn't really carry on with the, uh, the love triangle. Um, one of my friends, she actually found the love triangle really really annoying in this book but I was kind of oblivious to it. I thought it was pretty obvious who Nyx wanted and who she wasn't interested in and the effect it was having on that other person. So, but for this one we get a lot more really annoying relationship paranoia protectiveness thing going on and the whole kind of plot of this book is basically save certain person. It really got annoying, really got annoying. Um, I think both of them are too strong of characters to really care about that stuff anyway and they've got a great example of how not to be so why would they then walk straight into the same kind of situation um, especially Cash this time we get his point of view and I wasn't blown away by his point of view I could see how it was necessary but I don't think that his point of view really added anything to the book that wasn't already apparent by Nix's point of view there was a lot of things I really did like this bit of this book. I feel like I'm much better at talking about negative things than good things, but I think negative things interest me quite a lot somehow, so I tend to ramble about those more. Um, but the good things, the description is really great as ever, like everything was really easy to imagine, I think apart from this particular kind of place and its culture and things like that. It wasn't very evocative in a kind of way, but it had some really cool creepy undertones that I wish had been explored more. This book also had some really cool maps, so here's one. That way. Yay! Um, and it was really nice to see all these different places actually because um, it's nice to have a kind of tangible map. If you haven't read the first book then uh, you probably shouldn't be watching this video because I'm, um, yeah. But 
they travel through time using maps and not just time but places they can go to mystical places and um from mythologies basically anywhere that they've drawn a map from they can they can do it they can go there and um, that's a really cool concept blake is a character i really hoped after dropping off the uh, whole love triangle thing that he would develop more into a more complex character um, come into his own strength I suppose uh, I don't know I think the characterization in this book lacked something I wanted more from it from a second book it's, it almost has a first book feel it's a bit strange it, it doesn't feel quite like the second book syndrome it has its own complete plot um, you've got all the kind of things that you would have in a normal first book and there's this kind of history we are expected to know, which comes from book one, but at the same time it does feel like a book one. Um, which is a bit strange, because I'm, I'm not sure I really have read a second book that feels that way. There was also uh, Rotgut and... oh, what's her name? What's her name? I, I don't know her name, um, but she's really cool. Those two they get a few little moments in this book, um, which I really appreciated, but they do kind of feel like, again, moments from the first book. And there's only two of them, and it'd be really nice to see the whole crew as a thing, and like a, the support networks they have, and how important they are to each other. And I feel like Rocket and, I've forgotten her name, but her, uh, they're just, they're in the background and they occasionally crop up and say something interesting or important or reminders of their diversity and they don't feel like people and I really wanted more of that. Um, like there's a lot of focus in this book on Nix and Cash and her father, um, Slate, Slate, I like the play on Flint but Slate, uh, their relationships are really interesting, the way they change and uh, the kind of tensions between them all and that's really great and I loved seeing that but I did want more from the crew and Blake and Dirt. I don't know her purpose whatsoever she was just kind of thrown in there and you kind of think she has a purpose and she must have one and there's a point and she's linked to Donald Crowhurst you know like why did he choose her and what why why never find out oh, that's possibly a spoiler but I, I don't know but maybe you will find it and I missed it, I have no idea. But I'd love to know, if you think there is a point to her, go ahead, tell me, because I, I can't see it at all. She was just kind of like this blip on the pages and you're like, okay, that's it, done, bye. The one thing I that really let this book down for me, I think, was the use of a real person as a bad guy. And not just a real person from history, but a real person from very recent history. Um, Donald Crowhurst, he's actually a local man, or he was a local man, I live about four miles from where he lived, and two years ago, um, oh, what was his name? Ugh. Colin Firth, Colin Firth was um, in the town next to where I am, um, filming um, a film about Donald Crowhurst, he was playing that role. I don't actually recall if that film ever came out, I don't, I didn't see it, but the whole town was like, covered in 1960s, 70s cars and it was really really cool and there was lots of famous people stalking going on and my mum peering out of her window as he walked by and things like that. So there was a lot of interest in this man and his story. Donald Crowhurst, uh, if you don't know, um, he was a man who entered a race, around the world race, um, with a yacht and uh, he pretended to be winning basically. He parked himself off the coast of Brazil and he sent in reports saying he was at so-and-so place repeatedly um, until they figured him out and when they found his boat he wasn't there and presumably he committed suicide. Um, and his journals they were read and the assumption I think from the investigation into it was that he was suffering severe mental illness um, he was basically losing his mind out there, his his notebooks are full of ramblings and all sorts of things and they believe he did kill himself. And that's a, that's a really awful story and I think for someone like this whose writing I really admire and I think she's done great at representing diversity in different people and histories that we don't hear about and mythologies that we don't really know about or unexplored very well in literature, 
I think this really, really let me down because this is portraying a man who died only like 40 years ago. Um, and his family, which are referenced in the book, they're possibly still around. Like, there's no reason his daughter isn't like my mum's age now. And I just, I find that really, really uncomfortable that a man who suffered severe mental illness and died as a result of it has been written into this book as a really awful person, a bad guy, who does really awful things to get what he wants. And yeah, that, ugh, I can't really explain it, but it, it just makes me really uncomfortable. And that was my big issue all the way through this book was that I was holding this lump saying, is she actually going to turn this around? Is she going to make this not just an excuse to use somebody's name as a as a villain, really? I wanted her to make him kind of, not redeemable maybe, but a deeper character, a complex character, and he really wasn't. It was just a kind of, he had one goal in this book, um, and maybe it was not quite the goal that Nyx expected him to have in the end, but I still don't come away from this book feeling like I, I empathised with Donald Crowhurst, which I definitely did reading his stories um, in the news and the local area. There's books published about him that talk about what happened and I really did empathise with him and like feel for him and this, this book I think has done him a terrible injustice really and I think a lot of people won't know who he is. It's, it's only by chance that I happen to live very close to where he lived. And yeah, oof, I could probably ramble on about it. But I think, yeah, other than that, I really did enjoy this book. I'm sorry, I'm being really negative. There are good things, there are really good things. I love her writing. I will definitely read any book she wrote. Right? She, I will definitely, <laughs> I will definitely read any book she writes in the future, but I think just a little knock on that representing real people whose families are still around is an issue. Yeah. Overall, I really did enjoy this book. I did give it uh, four stars. The fifth star was entirely lost because of the Donald Crowhurst thing and possibly a bit to do with the hits, non-existent uh, relevantness, I guess. Um, I feel like this book could have been a bit tighter in the editing, maybe a little bit more time needed to be put into it, but I think I'm being overly picky about the writing and kind of character representation other than Donald Harris, that's a big issue, but other characters. She's got a great sense of dialogue and uh, emotional tensions and things like that and that's really really great to see because I love a bit of uh, argumentativeness in the uh, characters you know. I really do love this series and I love this writer and I think it's important to be critical of things you like um, which is maybe not common belief but I believe that so if I'm giving you lots of negatives and nitpicky points it's because I really like something unless it's something I really don't like I, yeah, I'm gonna stop rambling. Um, that's all. <laughs> uh, happy reading. Goodbye. <sighs> okay. They sent me and said, they, they, start, <laughs> oh my God. I keep saying kind of. Why do I keep saying kind of? They stop doing that. The, so, but, but, blah, blah, blah. that was, what a word. It starts, <laughs> oh man, okay, at the, in the third, the, in the, I already said that, ayy.